my name is uh, Eric Wing. I'm one of the uh, technical leaders here at Trend Micro. Uh, do, do welcome you here. Uh, we do have a um, great host today. So from our zero day initiative, we have Dustin Childs. So he's gonna be our, our kickoff speaker and he's gonna th go through what ZDI is and um, you know how they discover vulnerabilities like the recent Samba uh, vulnerability that was discovered. And then to kind of show you the uh, assessment tools we have available so you can see if you have these uh, vulnerabilities uh, within your environment, we have uh, two subject matter experts who'll be uh, showing you those assessments, uh, Tom Buathong and then also Hai Wing. So, with that, I'll go ahead and hand it off uh, to Dustin, and, and thanks for joining. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Let me share out my slides here. Uh, thank you for having me today, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dustin Childs, and I am the Senior Communications Manager for the Zero Day Initiative. And if you're not familiar with ZDI, we are the world's largest vendor bug bounty program. So what that means is, excuse me, the largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. What that means is we buy bugs from independent security researchers around the globe. And when vendor agnostic, so that means we buy Microsoft bugs, Apple bugs, IBM bugs, Cisco bugs, ICS SCADA bugs, all sorts of different vendors bugs uh, that we purchase for varying prices from these researchers around the globe. And what we do with those bugs is we take them and we analyze them and we provide filters for our customers. So as soon as we get the bugs, uh, we hand off the information to DV Labs and they generate pre-release filters for tipping points, and they push those filters out to customers. Then we report those vulnerabilities to the affected vendor for resolution. We have a 120-day disclosure timeline, so that means that uh, the vendors have four months to produce a patch for publicly available for these that to make it publicly available for these privately reported vulnerabilities. So that way, that even if you are not a member, you eventually get protections through the. Uh, through the patches. Uh, we do this a lot. Uh, in fact, for the last 13 years, we've been the number one in uh, disclosing vulnerabilities. Uh, and if you look at our numbers from 2020, this is compiled by Amdia, 60% of all vulnerability disclosures came through Trend Micro uh, ZDI. Uh, and that is the highest level of disclosed vulnerabilities for all security levels uh, and uh, is officially what we call a lot. Uh, and what does 2021 look like? Well, we had even more disclosures in our busiest year ever. Uh, we've been doing this since 2005. And you can see in 2005, we had a whopping one bug that we purchased. Uh, from then, last year, we had now had 1,604 published advisories. Only 8% of those ended up as zero days, meaning we disclosed without a vendor patch. The rest ended up as uh, security patches. Uh, if you're getting pre-release filters, those are coming out about 90 days ahead of the vendor patch. So you're protected ahead of time. And then what most people don't realize is zero day exploit, yes, can be relatively rare. However, in day vulnerabilities, meaning in things that have been known for a number in number of days, uh, not in for known. I did go to Kentucky public schools, but even I know that. Uh, so it's in number of days. Those are what really gets picked up by malware and ransomware and put into exploits. Uh, but if you have those pre-release filters in place, that protection extends past when it becomes an end day through the time where that takes you to test and apply the patches. Everyone knows that it takes a little bit to apply patches. Most folks don't get it out within 48 hours, but according to the FBI, exploits are generally seen within 48 hours of a patch being made available. Bugs are generally hard to find, unless it's the second Tuesday of every month, in which case Microsoft will tell you, well, here's the latest 51 bugs in our products. And Adobe will tell you, well, here's the latest in ours. Uh, and from that, people go off and reverse engineer those patches and then they will come out with those exploits. We try to get ahead of that by purchasing those bugs. Uh, of the 2021 Microsoft disclosures, uh, ZDI accounted for about 19% of all of the CVEs that they patch. So we're very busy. We get a lot of uh, bugs throughout the year. However, that's not the only way we acquire bugs. And if you have any questions, please do put them in the q and I will be happy to answer them uh, once I am done with this. I'll be you know, filling out all those, all those questions, but please ask questions if you have them. Uh, but anyway, this is not the only way that we, that we acquire bugs. Starting in 2007, we started the Hone to Own Hacking Contest. And this started with a very simple conceit. Now, 2007 was a very different time than it is now. Uh, in fact, it was a time where 
the general perception among the public was Macs were generally unhackable. There were these uh, cute little TV commercials, I'm a PC and I'm a Mac. Uh, for those of us like me who are old enough to remember those, the conference organizer at CanSec in Vancouver uh, decided to have a little contest. He was gonna take a MacBook and put it on the contest on the conference network. And the first person who hacked it, who pwned it, would get the MacBook. Uh, the pwn it and you own it. Uh, and ZDI offered $10,000 for the exploit. So from that very simple beginning, we have grown the contest now into five distinct locations. We have, uh, we still maintain the Vancouver competition, but now it focuses on enterprise tools, uh, operating systems, enterprise applications, as well as virtualization products in automobiles. We have Tesla, who is a co-sponsor of that competition now. And coming up this year in just a couple of months, we'll actually have two vehicles, a Model 3 and a Model S uh, available in Vancouver for researchers to target. The highest, uh, that's actually going to be the highest award, uh, if you can get it, uh, the top level for that is $600,000 plus the Tesla. So it's pretty cool. Pwned Owns Tokyo started a few years later, and that became our consumer-focused thing. So we started looking at phones, as well as uh, smart speakers, televisions, home routers. This year, we added printers to that. Pwned Owned Miami is coming up in April. That's when we added uh, industrial control systems and SCADA products. Uh, due to the pandemic, we've kind of had to shift some of our locations. We have a large office in Toronto, so we've won a lot of things out of there. And our most recent contest in 2021 uh, actually happened at Own to Own Austin. This is where the ZDI is headquartered, even though I'm remote. Uh, and we decided to, it'd be a lot easier to just go to Austin since we couldn't quite go to Tokyo at the time. So we had Pwn to Own Austin, and it ended up being an amazing show. Uh, we For our first year there, we introduced printers, network printers. That was a very interesting thing, uh, and included one of the most interesting attacks we saw. Maybe not the most technically brilliant, but when you're monitoring a printer and all of a sudden it starts playing Thunderstruck from ACDC, kind of cool. Um, routers, uh, we did not include televisions this year for reasons that are kind of a different talk. But let's just say there's there was no reason to include TVs. The security is just that poor. Uh, as well as you know routers and NAS devices, which we added last year and returned this year. So what were the results? Well, we awarded over a million dollars for 61 zero-day vulnerabilities over the four-day contest. And it was scheduled to be a three-day contest, but we had so many entries, we had to extend it to a fourth day. And we also had to run a bunch of things after hours uh, kind of pwn to own after dark to get all of the con contestants in and make sure it all happened. At 58 separate, separate entries from 22 different teams from around the world, uh, everywhere from individuals up through big companies like uh, CloudStrike and Star Labs and DevCore and lots of different people participating from around the globe. The master of pwn is the overall winner of pwn to own, and that was awarded to Team Synactive. They were awarded $197,500 over the contest. They got that cool platinum record as well as a jean jacket. We like to theme our Pwned Own contest around certain things. And of course, Austin is the uh, world capital for live music. So we went with a music theme, including the platinum record. And of course, the great 80s jean jacket, with lots of patches. Uh, Master of Pwn, the way Pwned Own works is we begin by uh, literally drawing names out of the hat to determine a schedule. So the first person to win a category gets the full award. And then the awards kind of go down round after round in that category. So you could have a bad draw and end up not in a great place. With Master of Pwn, the points get awarded the same each round. So you could have a bad draw and still demonstrate great research and end up the number one team. Uh, team Synactive just happened to be that. They, they had a little bit more than everyone else DevCore was a close second, and uh, it was a great contest. So, like I said, printers, NAS, smart speakers, routers, uh, pretty much every category had at least one successful demonstration, including phones. The Samsung Galaxy was hacked, uh, although uh, not the iPhone or the Pixel. We still just uh, are not getting enough dollar signs out there to make that happen. In doing this, uh, we often ask for vendors to work with us and participate uh, and co-sponsor it. This year, Western Digital was one of those 
They called us a few weeks before the contest and said, hey, we want to include the beta version of our latest product, this network attached storage device. We want the beta version in there and we're going to offer $45,000 to anyone who could hack it. Uh, and it turns out that one of the teams did. They found a critical class vuln uh, that was used to uh, compromise the MyCloud home. So this was Star Labs. And I'm not going to say these names because I messed them up. But Wen and Billy, that's uh, how I refer to them, because I can get that part of it. Everything else, I just leave alone. Um, they're the team that uh, took a look at Western Digital Beta, and uh, they compromised it. They combined an out-of-bounds read along with a heat-based buffer overflow, a couple of different bugs. That's another thing that we find these days. It's not one bug usually that uh, is able to exploit any target or device. It's a chain of bugs. So this is what they did. Uh, they won $45,000 for their demonstration. And one of the neat things about Pondown is that we have the vendors there, usually on site. In this case, they were virtual. We were all on a Zoom call with them. Uh, and we disclosed the bugs to Western Digital immediately. So that was great. So within the hour, Western Digital had the bugs, were triaging them, and had diagnosed them pretty quickly. It's like, hey, this is a Samba problem. Uh, and that was the, the root cause of the bugs. Samba, of course, is a third party. It's not owned by Western Digital. So they reported the bugs to Samba for resolution. Uh, after the event, uh, we have our own uh, security researchers that, that do their own investigations. One of them, uh, Lucas Leong, found variants. Uh, in other words, uh, Wen and Billy used A, but Lucas said, hey, A works, B can work too uh, for the bugs. Uh, and then when Samba published their advisory, we learned that Orange Sci of DevCore had also discovered some of these things and reported them independently. So what exactly did they report? Well, it became known as CVE 2021-44142, better known as remote code execution in a Samba module. Uh, and the bugs really affected devices that support time machine. Um, now there's a, within Samba, there's something called the fruit module. And the fruit module allows Samba to interact with Apple devices. The NetaTalk is the file system protocol that Apple uses. Uh, and if you think it's a little silly for them to call the module to talk with Apple, the fruit module, then we're in agreement. But that's what they named it. That's the actual name. I'm not just branding it or anything. Uh, but anyway, the problem was there. Uh, and really what happens is the attacker can put arbitrary values into a private attribute. They can write things into a location that they should not be able to write it. Uh, and this can lead to multiple uh, memory access problems that go out of bounds when that vulnerable structure is later used. Uh, this is rather technical. Uh, if you wanna read the technical details, just hit that QR code. We have a full blog on it, goes into much more detail. I'm just glossing over it. This is the Cliff Notes version or Spark Notes version, depending on uh, what generation you are. This was fixed by Samba and they released their patch on January 31st of this year. Uh, they fixed it by adding additional checks and to making sure that uh, the private entry list stayed private. You couldn't Attackers couldn't write anything else there. This was both good and bad um, because the question becomes, well, how many devices are actually affected? And the answer is maybe. Um, every server that uses an affected Samba version and is configured to work with Apple file systems is affected by this. However, if I were to just download Samba right now, which I can do, and set it up on a server, which you can do, this is not configured by default. So you would need to go into your Samba configuration and turn this on. However, comma, uh, if you go out and buy any device or you know, get any vendor to come in and set up anything that works with the Apple file system, specifically with Time Machine, so if I go to Best Buy right now, and I buy some storage device that it says works with Time Machine and I plug that onto my network, it is configured by default and it is therefore affected. So it's a very interesting question. Um, how many third-party devices are affected by this? Because Samba's patch doesn't really fix everything. Yes, it fixes the bug in Samba, but that Samba patch doesn't get distributed out to all the devices that run Samba. For example, Western Digital, has to take the Samba patch. They have to bucket it up into their own patch system and then send it out to Western digital clients, which they have done. Uh, 
Not every third party vendor has done this, however. But every third party vendor that uses Samba in this manner will need to package up a ship and uh, package up a fix and then ship it out to their customers. And this is especially uh, interesting because not every third party vendor will tell you that device, that device that runs Samba and is affected is still under support. We've had this problem in the past where certain vendors at certain times we've reported certain bugs to them and they said, oh, that's very interesting. Uh, all of those devices are end of life as of tomorrow uh, based on the decision that we've made today because we would rather just end of life the device rather than fix those bugs. So in some cases, uh, you can end up with a, a device that might not ever receive a patch from the vendor, even though it is affected by this vulnerability. So that's something to keep in mind. Enterprises are recommended to scan their networks to see if they have any of these devices out there. Uh, and if they have these devices out there and they haven't received patches, to contact the vendors, to try to get the patch, to update their security device. So that's the basics of the Samba bug. It is critical. Uh, it is unauthenticated, which means it can be hit by anyone you know, anonymously. You don't have to log in first. Remote code execution. The code execution occurs at the system level. So you're executing code as root. You're not executing code. It's just a regular user. Uh, and the only fix to it is to apply this patch or to disable Time Machine. So if you can't uh, apply a patch, you can actually turn off the Apple functionality and be in a non-vulnerable vulnerable state. However, if, you're, if you have the Apple functionality enabled, you're probably using it. So that's probably not a very real, realistic uh, scenario for you. So that's basically what ZDI is. Again, we're the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. Uh, we buy bugs from all over the world. We host the Pwn to Own competition, two of which are coming up very soon. Pwn to Own uh, Miami is coming up in April. Again, that's for industrial control systems and SCADA. And then the following that in May, we'll be back in Vancouver with Tesla, with uh, Microsoft and VMware and Adobe and Google and all of the other main players. Uh, please connect with us. Uh, I blog quite a bit. Uh, and actually I'm in the process of publishing some blogs on analyzing bugs and a way to let you find your own. Um, and also if you find some bugs, uh, please email us, zdi at trendmicro.com. Please encrypt your email. Uh, if you send open text email about a bug, it's no longer an O-Day because someone else could possibly read it. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom. I know he's gonna talk to you about a few different things. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer them. And I'll also be back for the, uh, the panel at the end, just in case you have, uh, think of something later. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you and then hand it over to Tom. All right, Thank, thanks uh, Dustin for, for the talk about ZDI. It's very informative. Uh, so yeah, my name is Tom Boathong and I am an engineer in the Great Lakes region. Uh, focused on Vision One, our mediation and response platform. Uh, I came from the customer side uh, with 13 years of experience. And today I'm gonna show you, I'm going to be showing you some tools that you can use to, to find, find any instances of Samba and, and, and figure out what, uh, what to do from there from mediation and so forth. So in my, in my Vision One platform here, where you would go is you'd go to security assessment. And then from here, on the front page here, you'll see you'll see a little blurb about, about Samba. Uh, and what you do is just click get started. And there's a couple different ways that you can that you can do run assessments on uh, in your environment. So there is a, a network assessment tool that will go through and scan your network to see if there's any vulnerable instances. I see that that's that's worthwhile because if there if you don't have our Vision One agent or our Apex agent um, on those devices, that's a nice way to be able to be able to broaden out your search. Uh, today, I'm going to go through and talk about the Vision One assessment tools. So from here, you would click on Select Linux Endpoints from Inventory, and for this, I have a couple different in instances of uh, of Ubuntu. Uh, that we're going to check. So what you do is select uh, the instances there and then run assessment. 
And this one usually take a couple minutes to, to see what's on those systems. It'll take inventory and see what versions of Samba, which is installed, and then it'll generate a, it'll generate a report out for, for remediation steps afterwards. There's another way that we can, that we can test by script. Uh, I'll post a link in the, in the chat, or you should see a link uh, coming shortly for that. And with that, you can run your run custom scripts so that um, so that you can check the results that way too. So this will take a second here. And for all those that you don't know, D Dustin did a great job, but Samba is used for sharing and if and other things like if you have a domain controller with Linux, um, it, it's utilized there too. And as you can see, my reports is all done. So now all I have to do is just generate report. And now you can see that there's, uh, from the results, there's four Samba configurations detected. And then I have one that's that needs a patch. And from here, you can you can expand out the list and see what what versions and what versions are being used. And you can see with this one here that requires a patch, looks like it is the the, the vulnerable version of Samba. And and from here, now you can you can start digging into all the other different different versions and different instances that I have. And then there are some steps in remediate, or there's some links here for remediation steps here. And from there, you can click on that link and you can see kind of what, uh, what we have or what some of the background from ZDI, some of the other background and how to how to remediate the vulnerability itself. So, any questions? Let me check the chat. But other than that, that's how you'd use Vision One to assess the assess your environment to see if there's any Samba vulnerabilities. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it off to Hi uh, for for uh, some log for J and uh, Samba uh, talks. Awesome, thanks, Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, the, my name is Hai Nguyen. I'm actually located in Southern California. Uh, so what I would like to share with everyone, uh, and actually, Tom, I need uh, your help. There we go. So couldn't share my screen yet. <laughs> so what Tom showed earlier was around the Samba vulnerability in our assessment tool um, to identify systems that are potentially uh, vulnerable to Samba. Uh, similarly, there are other vulnerabilities that Trend Micro is able to assess. Um, one in particular was not too long ago, the log for shell vulnerability. In the same vein, you can download uh, the tool uh, to be able to identify systems and exact and understand exactly the path or the location where uh, we identify the log for J libraries. Um, like Dustin has mentioned before, there are potentially a lot of other applications, vendors that might use Samba. Log4j is very similar, right? It's a very common library that could be used by various different applications and could be buried underneath various different applications. So it's very hard to identify potentially where you're affected. So this is where Vision One uh, can really shine and help our customers or even um, organization that doesn't own trend to be able to identify where uh, they're vulnerable and be able to address that um, in itself here. So for example, um, I'm not gonna go through the assessment process similar to what Tom did. I think you guys already saw how that's done, but I just wanna highlight here are the, the details of what you can identify and it does provide uh, within our platform recommendations or how you can address uh, vulnerabilities as we identify these major campaigns and we'll add additional assessments to as the threat landscape you know constantly changes and there are other uh, highly visible and critical vulnerabilities that are identified. Um, so from a mitigation perspective there's ability obviously we always recommend the vendor patch that's the best way but for customers that can't easily patch right away um, we do have the ability to virtually patch that vulnerability because we know exactly how the vulnerability can be exploited. We can apply an intrusion prevention prevention rule to prevent that exploitation. While your organization really 
um, vet out the official patch and buying your buying you time to not only identify the vulnerable systems, but also um, do your due diligence to patch and vet out the patch itself. I want the another difference between the log for J and, and and Samba is if we look at our threat intelligence, um, there are a lot of indicators of compromise or indicators of attack um, just relating to the log4j itself. So if I'm actually going to just look at the trend micro research here, you can see there are a lot of different IOCs uh, that are known. And within the Vision One platform, uh, for our customers that has our Vision One technology enabled, Telemetry is constantly being sent to this platform so we can proactively sweep against your telemetry to see where not have we seen indications where uh, these indicators were um, were with within your environment. And then if they were, we can easily identify what systems when the when it was identified and for you to be able to react and respond and mitigate against those. Um, indicators as quickly as possible. With that, uh, I'll hand it over to Milo. Thanks, hi. Thanks again for um, that uh, very, I guess, uh, a very nice walkthrough of how we could really help our customers. So I invite again our friends who uh, joined us, Dustin, hi, and Tom, if you can turn on your camera. So we'll, we'll try to answer some of the questions that we're getting in the chat. Um, but before I do that, I know that um, we're, as we're doing some of this webinar back to back, um, we're still not, um, I guess, recovered from Log4j. Uh, that's something that kept us busy in December and uh, the coming January as well. And now here comes another one, right? I hope Samba is more like a song or a dance, but it doesn't sound like one. Uh, but anyhow, I'd like to kick in a little bit of, uh, let's probably step back a little bit. Um, maybe I will ask Dustin uh, uh, this portion first. Um, we know that for this particular vulnerability, it was actually given a score of 9.9. .9. Um, in the industry that we play with, we were very familiar with the scoring. But can you bridge some level of awareness of what the significance of that 9.9 .9 a little bit? Can you explain a bit uh, for our audience? Sure. If you're not familiar with that scoring, it's CVSS, or I think it stands for the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Just a way that we can kind of equate one bug to another to see how severe it is. 10 is the highest it can go. So obviously, 9.9 is very severe. And what mm -hmm. makes this bug so severe that gives it that uh, that level of, you know, that high number is the fact that it is remote. It is unauthenticated, like I said, so there's no uh, permissions needed. There's no user interaction required. So that there's no one on the affected target that has to do anything. There's no clicking links, there's no opening this or whatever. Uh, and then you're executing code at system level. So you can take over the box entirely. That's about as high as you can possibly go. The only thing that turns it down is it's not 100% default, uh, but it is a very common configuration, like I mentioned. So that's what gives this, e even though uh, we didn't see any active attacks ahead of time, we knew that it was possible because it was demonstrated at Pondone. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, one of those things where it's, it's a very, very severe bug. We know it's uh, going to be possible because we've seen it take place just in a controlled environment. Um, so that's the sort of thing where it gets the nearly highest rating just because of all of those factors. And I think that's why we at Trend responded the way that we have responded is obviously using this scoring method, right? And also yes. the fact... Yeah, yeah and ahead, if Dustin. anything, we learned from Log4j uh, how difficult that it was going to be to patch. And it's similar to that where Log4j is going to have such a long tail of patching because you've got all these third party and all of these various vendors that need to patch. It's going to be similar with this Sava bug where, like I said, you're going to have all of these vendors who have to roll out their own patches. And I mm -hmm. do think there's going to be a lot of vendors who just are going to say, no, we're not patching that. It's out of support or whatever. And you're going to end up with vulnerable devices out there that you're either going to need to cordon off somehow or replace or reconfigure to get them in, into a non-vulnerable state. Correct, correct. And I think um, we're always saying knock on wood. Hopefully we don't see what you've seen in the Ponto own 
um, demonstration. Right. But but let me jump into either Tom or Hi to give us a bit of perspective. You're very close to the customer. You you obviously work with them day in and day out. Um, I wonder what is the reaction on um, Samba right after the log for j Where are they at this stage? Is it they've learned enough or there's still a little bit of gray area where we need to support them? Maybe Tommy can start. I think from my experience with the customer, on the customer side, I think they, with log for j coming out and then Samba coming out, I feel they're, they're a little overwhelmed just because of all the all the different things that they have to do, all the different vendor contacts that they they have to remediate. So having having tools like what we have that we can start scanning things and and have them become a little bit more proactive than than having that reactive mindset. I think it's helping helping a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But but obviously vulnerabilities come out whenever they whenever they feel like it and whenever they want. So so having things, having these tools at their disposal is, is making it a lot better for them to, to react quicker. Correct. And the tools are really helping them um, obviously get a little bit of peace of mind that there is something that they can use. How do you want to add anything to that? Oh, so you're a new type? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, no, no I definitely want to um, expand upon what Tom has shared as well. Uh, for the customers that I've engaged in, um, because of Log4j vulnerability and the process and that they had to, to go through, uh, some of my customers felt like they're a little bit more prepared for Samba in the sense mm-hmm. that they already know how to leverage the Trend Micro tool sets to do the assessment. So be able to identify. But beyond that is they know how to mitigate these type of vulnerabilities really quickly. Like I mentioned mm-hmm. before, in my little quick demo is taking advantage of that virtual patching functionality at the the control levels that Trend Micro has to offer. Uh, So that way now they go into a mediate mitigation Mm -hmm. and then do the assessment later because they want to stop the bleeding, stop the attack surface. So understanding the, the mitigation capabilities and how they can minimize their risk they went directly there and then leveraging the assessment tool later on and, to do, and then formulate a strategy on how do we approach this, not only from maybe within our organization, but third party vendors that are and users might be new leveraging that could be vulnerable as well. That's a very interesting point, all right? Because in the past, they would jump immediately to any assessment tool. And of course, Trend Marker is just one, but we have numerous assessment tools helping the market, but normally that's the first call to action. But you have you provided a very interesting point of doing that as a secondary action, um, uh, pretty much. Uh, I'd like to focus a little bit on, I know we have not seen as of today, any potential attack or uh, movements on that, but either Tom or Har or maybe Dustin can also articulate what could likely be a potential attack scenario that um, hopefully we will not see, but uh, just some technical assumptions around. I think the most likely attack scenario was, it would be, uh, first of all, you'd see a scan. Hopefully you'd be able to detect the scan, looking for the vulnerable ports involved. Uh, and mm-hmm. then the attacker would uh, you know, launch their attack and, and take over the system. Uh, it would be relatively quick. Cause it, like I said, there's no user, user interaction involved. Uh, mm-hmm. So we definitely are need to look out for that sort of thing. And really, the, the attack scenario is more likely to come from an insider, simply because hopefully you're blocking some of this traffic at your perimeter firewall or IPS, uh, and hopefully you're, you're not letting that through. But especially for devices that are running Samba connected to the internet, definitely be on the lookout for any sort of connections that you're not expecting. Uh, I know IP address filtering is painful, but it's definitely one of those things that could also be considered. If you're only expecting five boxes to connect to your Samba server, maybe Mm -hmm. make sure you're restricting it just to those five boxes. If you have something else out there, people are going to be scanning for vulnerable systems. And once they find one, an attack is quickly to follow in most, in most cases. And then once they take it over, then it's, uh, you know, they can pretty much do anything with it. Most likely they're going to set up some sort of bot. They're going to farm it into some sort of botnet either for malware distribution or for DDoS. That's the most common thing that we're still seeing is it 
is these devices being joined to a botnet of one sort or another, mm -hmm. in which case you can look for the command and control traffic going out of the network uh, to hopefully isolate that now infected device and clean it up. Mm -hmm. Correct, correct. I think it's, um, it's almost uh, important also to mention that IPS protections are really one of the best aids that you could get, uh, especially for network traffic, right? Um, anyone want to comment further on that? Any other attack forecasts that you might have? I mean, I think just from my perspective uh, and humble opinion is uh, the attackers, because it's, it can be leveraged and exploited in so many different ways. And we know that ransomware is always top of mind, mm -hmm. easy money making uh, <laughs> tool for them. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that get packaged some in some form. Mm -hmm. uh, in the mm -hmm. future, just like how uh, SMB was version one was exploited, right, for WannaCry and uh, distribution. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if that was leveraged in some form or fashion. Yeah, yeah. I think the natural habitat of a lot of the threat actors is immediately lodge a payload that is mostly ransomware, right? Um, I want to stick to you, Hi, while you're still around. Um, in your sharing earlier, thank you for sharing with us the parallel between Log4j indicators versus Samba. Can you speak a little bit more of what other parallelism that you see from both of this vulnerability, at least on the customer's point of view and also on the technical side? Some parallels, I think a lot of it is the more on the far-reaching aspect of the vulnerability itself where mm -hmm. it goes beyond just Samba or Log4j is the, how prolific that is being used in the industry and various different vendors itself, which makes okay. it very challenging. Um, going back into looking at um, more of, you know, what we would consider supply chain type of scenarios. Uh, we saw that even with the solar winds situation in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so I think nowadays, with these type of vulnerabilities, it makes it very challenging for organizations to really get a handle and address them in an effective manner because there are things that are going to be out of their control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's a lot of elements, especially in the log4j, that a lot of our customers are being very challenged, and I think that's where you want to push more help. Um, Tom, I want to get into, I will try to combine one of our uh, questions that we got from the audience. In your sharing earlier, I have to admit, you made it sound so easy to run the scanner, to go through the assessment and remediation, but I know that's a lot of work also. So two questions, I'll do back to back. Um, are there other elements that are noteworthy um, that they have to watch out for when they use the assessment? Uh, that's question one. And then um, a question from our audience also is, um, there are a couple of limitations in the current tool that we're using. Uh, specifically, it's limited to VLAN. Um, any chance that we can expand um, this configuration tool to IP ranges or similar uh, indicators? I hope you still remember my question. <laughs> no, I do. So the, the first part, the, the assessment tool looks for the certain libraries in, in the systems itself. So with any Linux system, there are going to be packages that are installed. And within those packages, there it's a there's a registry that lists out what version, what version of the certain package. So let's, for example, Samba for this one. And it'll be able to figure out if the service is running, what version, and and kind of the details within there. So with the assessment tool, it's it's a very it's very e it's a very easy thing. And obviously, if I can do it, anybody can do it. But uh um it's, it's looking at those certain key indicators of, of Samba. So it's nothing, nothing impactful, nothing harmful there. Um, mm -hmm. So for the second question about the network network scanner, we'll, mm -hmm. I'll, we'll go back to our uh, developers and our team to, to, to see if we can expand out that, expand out that limitation. Because yeah, I totally understand that sometimes you're in a corporate environment you might be scanning in your internal corporate network where it might not be reaching to your data centers or your server VLANs and all that. So that's a good, that's a good one. Um, that's a good, good topic or a good uh, point to bring back to our developers. Yeah, and, and I, I also wanna yeah. 
I'm sorry, my also interrupt. Maybe I want to touch base as well. Tom also shared earlier that um, we do have a custom script that could be leveraged. Oh yeah. Uh, mm -hmm as an interim, right? As our, we're looking at expanding that networking scanning tool capability, the script is there. Uh, you can leverage that to push out, you know, via different deployment methods across like, your entire environment uh, to identify it. Or if uh, you want to leverage it within vision one or, term or platform, you're able to select all your various different systems and remotely ran, run that script, even if you didn't um, necessarily want to use the assessment tool itself. So you do have alternatives uh, to address that same situation. And that, that's really good uh, because I, I know that as soon as you're starting your investigation, cleaning up the network and all of these things, a lot of things are popping in and say, okay, can I look at that? Can I look at that? So I think those customized um, scripts will really, really help. But I will defer to Tom to bring this wonderful feature to our dev team. Uh, I'm pretty sure they will welcome that. Um, so a lot of this, those are developed with a lot of agility. So we welcome those comments. And if you wanna add more features to it, feel free to put it in our chat and uh, we'll share that to our DevOps uh, group. Um, I wanna go to a, quite a controversial question because I have this question also in mind. Um, we all know that, uh, my, my point is, how come there are a lot of vulnerability scanners, right? There are, again, uh, a lot of available tools. Um, where are they? Are they not working in mitigating some of this vulnerability as we speak pretty much on Log4j and also with, with, with Samba? I just want to take your thoughts on that one. I'm looking at Dustin right now, so maybe you want to kick that up. <laughs> oh, okay. I wasn't going to comment on that one. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I don't know. It's an interesting thing is that the problem with vulnerability scanners, at least in my experience, is they're only as good as their known definition, their known database for vulnerabilities to scan for. So in other words, if you are scanning for complete garbage, your results are going to be complete garbage. Uh, and it's defining that uh, that database of, of real things that you need to be on the lookout for without generating thousands of false positives in a way that makes it very difficult. So of course, this was one of those things where everyone is trying to build a better mousetrap. So we do have so many vulnerability scanners out there doing things ever so slightly differently. Uh, one, hopefully better than the other that we're actually getting some meaningful results. But in my experience, that, that's kind of the way it is, is we have so many tools out there that say, yes, you've got all these vulnerabilities, but so few tools that are producing meaningful results that are actionable by the end uh, administrator, by the sysadmin who says, okay, here's how I remediate this, or here's how I define how I accept this risk. Uh, so it's the risk remediation, It's that gets very complicated. Uh, that's just my personal experience having you know, worked in this industry for a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll, I'm interested to see what uh, Tom and Wynn have to say on that. Or hi, <laughs> yeah, yeah. go ahead. I think regarding the vulnerability scannings themselves, I think um, there's a lot of tools and methodologies to identify where you're vulnerable, but that's pretty much the extent of it, right? It's just helping me identify where my risks are, but there are no mitigation action outside of applying an official security patch, which as Dustin mentioned earlier, there are some circumstances that that's not even available because mm -hmm. uh, those vendors opted to go and end of life a particular product or technology and so on. But uh, for our customers, they might not be able to easily move away from that technology because there's right. a dependency as well. Um, where Trend Micro is different and very unique to Trend Micro is we're able to provide that virtual patching mechanism. So whether or not you're talking about end of life applications or, uh, or whatever, you're unable to apply the patch, we have a compensated control that goes beyond not just only can we identify where you're vulnerable, but we can also provide mitigation actions. Um, and beyond that, as we talked about specifically within Log4j, within Vision 1, a lot of times when we talk about vulnerability, it's only after we disclose and know about it. But then as an attacker, they already have introduced certain malicious code within your environment. Um, and there's already some indications of that within the Vision One platform, we are able to provide visibility and understanding, have I ever seen any indication of those 
uh, indicators within my environment before I even ran an assessment potentially as well. Right. So I think from Trent Michael's point of view, uh, we are providing a more holistic approach from not only identifying invisibility, uh, am I affected uh, presently, currently in the past, and a way to mitigate. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a uh, one plus one plus one kind of support. Right. <laughs> uh, Tom, will push this on to you. One of the questions that we got from the audience is, is uh, does Log4j and as well as Samba, do they get virtual patching through Deep Security or Apex One? Uh, yep, so virtual patching is available for both. Uh, we'll we can post up the articles on that one, but you should be able to be covered via virtual patch within those two systems. Okay. And, and do you want to comment on Vulture B scanners and stuff? Or what are your experiences? Oh, yeah. So it, kind of coming from the customer side and now on the trend side with vulnerability <laughs> scanners, it kind of gives you just a point in time uh, of what's happening on the system. So, so if there's a, a piece of software that might have had that might have a vulnerability and you just conducted a vulnerability scan you're not going to catch that so with in my mind with vulnerability scanners i'd rather see a, a more continuous a more continuous mm -hmm. scan and more more frequent scanning of those systems to catch those vulnerabilities have a little bit more proactive approach than to have that reactive approach that vulnerability scanners can can bring and kind of going with what Hi and uh, and Dustin was saying, that sometimes with these vulnerability scanners, they might give you false positives or just give you the results and not not necessarily say this is step one, two, and three and how to mediate these things and how to patch these things. So going with again with what Hi was saying with Vision One, it does give you more of the more of the steps on how to do these, how to remediate, how to patch, how to how to fix these issues. So that's always a good always good for for customers because sometimes they don't have the time to to research or sometimes they don't have the time to really to really figure out how how to do these things and with vision one we provide those steps correct correct and i agree i always say i really feel for a lot of the of our ir soc or really the frontliners uh for security because it's one after the other right it, and we're not talking of um several system we're talking of uh imagine a huge enterprise having to scan vulnerability in their network it takes a lot of effort right so a tool that gives not not just one but at least most of the help that they need is really i think um a better choice right uh and whether that's trend or other industry tools we're open to it uh, but i think we just have to put the persona of the people solving that problem as we develop a lot of these tools right cool um I know we have a few more minutes uh, coming. We have a couple of more questions. So, so one of the things I'd like to get your opinion, and maybe Dustin, I will push this to you. Um, before we ended the year last year, we said hopefully Log4j would be the last time we will talk about it. But we opened up uh, January webinar with again a Log4j, and then here comes Samba again. Can you give us a little bit of forecast in terms of where do you see some of this vulnerability going? Will this occupy, will they be another hogger in terms of headline, uh, you know, after after Samba? What's your thought on, on, on their trajectory? Uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to see more bugs like Log4j and Samba rather than less. And the reason I say that is there are so many products out right now that incorporate open source libraries of some sort. I mean, let's face it, unless you were a hardcore developer, up until like last year, you had never heard of Log4j, even if you shipped it. It was just, okay, well, here's the logging thing. I just need to include it in my uh, application and then ship it out. Uh, so there are a lot of open source libraries and open source tools that are gonna be like that. And, and we're gonna find vulnerabilities for, and it's gonna be hard to track down. It's like, well, who's maintaining this? Uh, and it could mm -hmm. be that it's been abandoned, or it could be that it's not well maintained, or it could be that it's largely maintained by volunteers. Uh, mm -hmm. And now, who's responsible for updating it when you have multi million dollar companies who are shipping it, but you've got Ted in Wisconsin, who's the only one who's actually patching it? Uh, so, I, I think that's going to be a very interesting thing. Attackers are starting to understand this now that there are these weak points in programs that are hard to service. And they're going to start looking for those things. Uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. we will get better at finding them ourselves 
and yep. patching them or at least, uh, you know, remediating the risk from them before they get attacked. But I think we're going to see more of, of this type of thing rather than less in the future. I was hoping you will say the other way around, but uh, <laughs> I figure out you won't. Yeah. Uh, but I think this is where I think, um, you know, proper disclosure, this kind of programs that we're talking about on the own really helps because it helps us prepare uh, for the worst. I can just imagine that if we have not discovered this, uh, the world might be different, right? So. That right. And that's one of the helps. reasons why we run Pwn to Own and why we run our bug bounty program is we want to bring these bugs into the light of day before they can get used by the attackers. One of the neat things about Pwn to Own is uh, it, it ups the severity, it ups the, the bar to entry because, you know, normally reporting to ZDI, you don't need a full exploit. Pwn to Own, you yeah. need a full exploit. So it's a very high bar to get in. But mm -hmm. that high bar equates to also a high dollar amount reward where we're paying more than what we normally would uh, for a bug through our regular program. We're getting to those uh, bug broker uh, price ranges, uh, mm -hmm. but that's a different topic that if you want to talk the whole exploit okay. economics. Uh, but yeah, bring me back another month and I'll talk about where all the money goes in bug bounty programs and exploit brokers. And yeah, it's tough to do, but... It's one of those things that we try and Pondone has been very good in the past at sussing out these bugs and then getting to the light of day and then getting vendors to fix them as well as to implement uh, strategies that negate entire classes of bugs. Yep. And that's what we really want to do. We don't want point fixes. We want fixes that wipe out entire classes of bugs. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to point out. It's, it's I call it always like a baton. Uh, sorry, it's a marathon where you pass the baton. So as soon as there's discovery, you work with a vendor and then onwards to the customer or pre-filter rules and stuff, right? So it, it's really a race. <laughs> I'd like to go to um, either uh, Hi or Tom. Um, I'm just wondering, because you you always work with a lot of our customers, you're always in the field. Um, how do you perceive the organizations should continue building confidence in their security systems amidst this back-to-back -back vulnerability? And of course, they still have their traditional malware attack right and left, right? So. I want to take your thoughts on that one. I think customers now, my current customers, I think they're they're starting to shift into looking at third party risk. And mm -hmm. what I mean by risk is is what what how company or how software is used in in certain vendors. Like if they're kind of what Dustin was saying, are, are they updated? Who's updating it? What types of security practices that they're that they're utilizing with that certain vendor? So I think what we're what I'm seeing is that cu customers are now not only focused on their internal on their internal security program, but now more focusing on who they're partnering with. Because obviously, some if your security program is is tight and well defined, your vendor might not be, or whoever it is, their the partner might not be. So the attackers might be able to use them as a a foothold into their own environment. I think from my perspective, and I'll try to answer Theodore's question as well here in the chat uh, live, is um, the customers I engage with, they're looking more from how can I automate things response a lot faster? Because when you're looking at what happened for Log4j, it came out during near the holidays to end of the year. Our staff is, you know, half staff, uh, middle of the night, right? So resources is very constrained. And mm -hmm. customers are finding it more challenging and difficult for them to effectively even work through an incident, let alone a vulnerability. So they're also looking at some automation help to respond, uh, integrating with various different layers of their security controls, um, mm -hmm. or even looking at outside sources as to help monitor 24 by 7 when their staff is maybe asleep. Yeah. Right. Those, so those different attributes um, and the great thing that at least the customers that I deal with that does have Vision One, they recognize that Trend does have the ability to integrate with various different service uh, services or security controls, uh -huh. whether that is existing Trend uh, controls or even third party security controls. So we're really providing a service integration platform beyond just a threat exchange and threat defense platform itself. Uh -huh. Yeah, and if I could kind of piggyback onto that, there was something similar that happened with this Samba bug. And there were a lot of people who were very frustrated with Samba and their timing of the release of the patch. 
due to Chinese New Year. Uh, so mm-hmm. there were essentially a lot of folks in Asia who were out. So it was, you know, it's their holiday uh, and they were not available to respond to this. Um, getting to the question of AI, in our experience, at least when it comes to finding bugs, uh, mm-hmm. I'm not against AI at all. I just haven't seen it be effective yet. So it would be nice if it continues to develop. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, like on a personal level, I used to be like legitimately afraid of a robot uprising until I got a robot vacuum cleaner. That thing's an idiot. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not worried about AI yet. I think we're generations away, literally, between before we can see AI be sophisticated enough to really spot what we need it to spot uh, when it comes to looking at this. I'm hoping that happens because humans, of course, are fallible and we're always going to be shipping code with bugs as long as we're mm-hmm. writing code. So I'm, I'm hoping it will uh, happen. In the meantime, uh, my robot vacuum is stuck underneath the same chair for the 37th time. So that's where we're at with that. Well, a lot of donations uh, are, are open to donations, Dustin. If you don't like that robot, you can always take it uh, <laughs> rather than the traditional style. But anyway, I think, and, and thanks for weaving that in high, the question on AI, I think that that's really the promise of AI, right? To make lives easier, more efficient to us. But I agree somehow with Justin, it will take a bit of time. We're optimistic, uh, but I think there, there are, you know, a lot of applications of AI that we are loving right now. Uh, a part of it is the telemetry, the monitoring, the visibility and behavioral uh, stuff. So yeah, we're there, we're getting there. Um, we're well, down to our last three minutes, so I wish we have more time. But can I ask you, gentlemen, um, you know, moving away from just vulnerability and all that has occupied our time since the holiday, can you please, uh, you know, share to our audience uh, what probably are your top two security initiatives uh, that would probably move a bit of middle in the organization so that they can improve their security posture. Um, apart from what you have shared earlier, uh, what are the other things that you will encourage them um, to probably enforce? Uh, anyone can start. That's it. I, I, you- I guess I'll start. Uh, you- my re- recommendation is the same as it's been for years, and it's boring, but it's tried and true, and it's proven to be the most effective thing you can do patch early, patch often. Uh, Most of the exploits that we see online are bugs that have been patched. Uh, The CSIA came out yesterday. Here's nine vulnerabilities. Two were from this week. Two were from 2014. So uh, definitely take the time and patch. I know it's a pain in the butt. Uh, I know it's irritating and disruptive, but it's also proven time and time again to be the most effective remediation of risk is to simply apply the vendor supply patch. So that's my recommendation. I wish I had something more uh, interesting or or thought provoking, but just patch. Basic, love it. Tom? Uh, Same here, honestly. Just from my years as a customer, patching was was difficult and it wasn't fun. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't sexy. It's, It's a needed, it's a necessary evil that needs to be done because exactly what Dustin was saying, vulnerabilities are over. And if you're not patched for something that was disclosed a couple of years ago, you're still open to that vulnerability. Um, I think the next thing would be automation. Automation is, is good mm-hmm. because obviously we're all, we're all short staff. There's people with technical knowledge that might not be there and having that automation piece helps, helps move that needle a little bit more than what, um, than just main, than the manual effort that, that's used now. Good point. Hi, you have the last one. I think for me, um, it's more around probably technical debt. There's a lot of old legacy applications, uh, end of life platform that customers just can't get off of. So even if uh, they do a great job of patching normally for things that are supported, they still have things that are they can't easily move out of where now you're talking about in IoT environments, POS systems, things like that. Um, identifying where your legacy applications, your, your dependencies are and being able to have a, a strategy on the life cycle of those applications and, uh, and devices would be help reduce the, the attack surface. Uh, and expanding upon what Thomas shared around automation, Automation is great, but the tools need to be able to work with one another. So bringing in the 
an ability to have a more holistic view across not only just the endpoints, we know that's where a lot of the problem originate, but it spreads mm -hmm. quickly. So being able to bring all of that together and be able to work interoperably to respond and understand your risk is also a key important factor. Um, and think about how are you gonna address things in a critical situation? So, you know, just maybe practice your incident response, have a um, kind of like what Netflix does with Chaos Monkey and everything else, throw a wrench in the system and see how you respond to an incident. How quickly can your team, is your team prepared um, to respond to an incident? Correct, correct. And I love to combine all your, your sharing to, you know, there's non-negotiable. You have to patch. Uh, the secrets of automation can be a, a new discovery. But of course, I like also what Hai said, do not neglect the legacy, the things that you don't use. It doesn't mean that they're there. They cannot be attacked, right? So wonderful. Uh, to me, it's basic. If you want to enjoy your holiday, the next one or your next weekend, just batch, right? Because they come in during this peculiar time. So thank you for joining us. I will turn it over to Eric to some of additional resources that we want to give you. Um, Eric, you have the floor. Thanks, Myla. So I did, I did post up there about a minute ago, um, our uh, breach detection site. So if you go to trendmicro.com slash breach detection, that will uh, point you to resources on ZDI and, and everything we've talked about here, as well as our past uh, webinars. Uh, this webinar will also be available um, on that site. So if there's anything you missed, or if you want to repeat something, you can go back and, and rewatch that or uh, let your friends know that it is available. And also have uh, everybody's email on here as well. So if there's any additional questions that you have that we weren't able to get to, um, or if you think of something later, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, so with that, I, I really appreciate everyone taking time out of their day and joining us. Um, and we hope to see you on uh, some future uh, webinars. Thank you so much.